invertebrates are animals without a backbone. Without a backbone, they account for 95% of living species. So 34 out of the 35 animal phyla are invertebrates. So which ones of these are invertebrates? Is this one an invertebrate? No. Oh, nope. Nope, an anglerfish, not an invertebrate. What about this one? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Good, yeah, that's a sea slug. Uh, what about this one? Mm, yes. yes. Yeah, invertebrate, this one? No. no. No, definitely a vertebrate. What about this one? Do you recognize that? Yes. Yes, exactly. That is, those are the tentacles of an octopus. So these are marine examples of the animal phyla, periphera, nidaria, mollusca. And we're going to look at some classes under the mollusca umbrella, the gastropoda, including slugs and snails, bivalvia, which are clams and mussels and such, and cephalopoda, which include your octop oct octopi. We'll also look at a marine phyla called echinodermata, in particular the class Arastoidae, which includes your sea stars, and the Holothuroidae, which includes your um, sea cucumbers. And then chordata, which is another phylum, will be for another time. So this is a rough uh, phylogenetic tree of some of these phyla. It does not include all of them. But it shows some of the transitions and evolution from our ancestors. So for example, if you look way back, the very first animalia were porifera. Porifera, the sponges. And, and really, you know, the more I look at sponges, the more I think they're more like a colony of cells uh, but they are considered a multicellular animal. But they have no true tissues, so no, no muscle tissue, uh, no, no organs, nothing like that. They just kind of work like a colony. So true tissue can be considered a transition to the, uh, the different phyla that exist. So some of those have radial symmetry, like the nidaria, and some have bilateral symmetry. So that's another transition from a common ancestor into two different groups, radial organisms of bilateral. So of the bilateral animals, uh, some of them don't have a body cavity at all. That includes the platyhelminthes. They have no, the flatworms, no body cavity. The others do have a body cavity and that separates them from the platyhelminthes. Um, of those, they have different kinds of coelom. A coelom is a cavity, a cavity within the body that contains organs. So another cavity is the, the gut, but this, this is not the gut. This is a cavity that contains organs called the coelom. So some organisms have what's known as a pseudocelum. Those are the nematoda, the roundworms. Some have a coelom that comes from cell masses, and some have a coelom that comes from the digestive tube. And this is where very early on in development, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference, but when they developed, structures arose from different kinds of cells in different locations. So the protostomes include the mollusca, uh, the arthropoda, and the annelida. And the deuterostomes include the echinodermata and the chordata. So the weird thing is you wouldn't think that the sea stars would be so closely related to the chordata, uh, but they are more closely related because of their very, very early embryology or development. So these are the animal phyla, all invertebrates. I know we've looked at them before, but I just wanted to show you a number of species approximately that are in the various phyla. The periphera, the sponges, about 5,000 or so. 
Uh, the Nidaria, about 10,000 species. Those are the two I'm going to talk about. I'm not actually going to lecture on all of the phyla. There's just too many, but just a few. The platyhelminthes, those are your flatworms. There's about 20,000 species. Um, the rotifers, we're not talking about either, but they're largely marine. They're very small. Um, and then there's the ectoprocta and the foranida, which I really don't know that much about, to be perfectly honest. Um, the brachiopoda, they are marine, not too many species. The nemertia, those are the ribbon worms. We saw that one digesting the seal. Uh, we have them here on our coast as well. There's about 900 species. Um, the acanthocelophi, don't know much about them. The netophora, those are comb jellies. Um, they're quite common, I think more in the south though. Not too many species either, only about 100. We are going to discuss in, in depth mollusca, it's about 93,000 species. The annelida, the segmented worms, uh, 16,500 species or so. And we're not going to cover the lorosifera or the preopula. Just a few more <laughs> to show you how many phyla there are. It's quite a few. Uh, the nematoda, those are the roundworms. We're going to look at the roundworms in lab. Um, the arthropoda, that's, we'll do it as, um, we'll look at some of those in the lab. We're looking at some of those because there are marine species and you'll do a, a small project on those as well. Uh, the cycleophora, well, there's only one species. Uh, tardigrada, 800 species. Someone saw those in the lab. Those are really cool. They're the small uh, water bears. Um, the uh, Onycheophora, I don't really know much about those. The Hemichordata, 85 species. That's the acorn worm. The only thing I know about the acorn worm, that's from going down to marine stations in um, California, is that they have a very well developed nervous system and they're used uh, to study the human nervous system. We'll look at the Echinodermata, about 7,000 species of those. Those are the spiny skinned organisms, the, um, the sea stars and the sea urchins. And the Chordata we'll do another day. So when did all of these organisms arise on Earth? Where do we find the, the first fossils? Well, there's a, a time period called the Cambrian Explosion. And it appears from fossils that have been found all over the world now, that that's when most major body plans appeared. The radial body plans and the bilateral body plans. And that is uh, when I think all 35, I have to look this up. Uh, let's see. Yeah, in a span of about 10 million years, all major body plans that you see today um, had evolved. Yeah. So within about 10 million years, all current body plans had evolved. Although now, this many years later, a lot of them are very modified. But that's when they first appeared. And uh, it's not to say that there weren't organisms, uh, invertebrates before then. There were. They've been discovered in Australia, the Idiocarans, I think. So someone discovered um, remains of these, but people thought that they, they didn't mean anything. But since then, they have also been unearthed. So how did the animal kingdom originate in the first place? So that's an enormous question, but um, it's quite interesting that if you look around today at all the different organisms that there are that are current, you can practically see the progression because there are unicellular organisms, tons of them. We've looked at them, the diatoms, the dinoflagellates. There are colonies like the vulvox, the cyanobacteria, although those are bacteria, not eukaryotes. Um, 
the multicellular algae. So colonies would have evolved before multicellular organisms. They, they just sort of progressed to being so codependent that they became one organism that just, just can't ever exist um, on, the different cells can't exist on their own in any way. So this is an early colony of protists, eukaryotes, an aggregate of identical cells, so just a small colony. So it's thought that within colonies, just like in colonies today, some of those cells became specialized and perhaps formed a sphere. So some of them may have become reproductive cells and some non-reproductive cells, those are called somatic cells, we still use that terminology. And then perhaps there was some infolding which made a kind of a gut, um, at least an area where prey could be concentrated and digested with enzymes secreted from these cells here. So that's a progression, a, a possible progression leading to multicellularity, the multicellular animalia. So the sponge line really early, really early line of, of animalia, uh, they probably evolved from multicellular coanoflagellates. That's the group most likely to have given rise to the animal kingdom. Here is a coanoflagellate colony. It has a stalk uh, that's formed by the colony, similar to the gelatinous material formed by Volvox. And they have a little collar here with a flagellate facing out that presumably sweeps food into this trumpet-like cylinder, which then transfers into the cell itself. So the periphera are um, a fairly widespread phylum. They're very ancient. The first um, evidence is of periphera is about 580 million years ago during the Cambrian. The first, mul the first known multicellular animals. Yeah, they're mostly oceanic. They're at all latitudes. They have a very wide depth range. They don't have to be close to the surface because they're, they're animalia. Animalia are, animalia are heterotrophic. They're heterotrophs. So therefore, they get their food from the environment. They don't require sunlight. They have a wide depth range. They don't have a mouth or a gut. Uh, their digestion is intracellular. So digestion occurs just within the cells themselves. No specialized tissue or organs, um, maybe about 9,000 species or so. They have no cell wall, but they have specialized cells. They have specialized cells. They're very cool, actually. So this is the coanoflagellate style cell that's part of this multicellular animal body. Um, it's called a coanocyte. Site means cell, so coanocyte. And its location, so this is, this is the sponge here. This is the outside of the sponge. And this is the inside of the sponge here. And these are the pores, hence the name porifera. So the coanocyte has that flagella that's now here facing into this area known as the spongocele, the spongocele. And water comes in through the pores and flows upward due to the movement of the flagellae. And that creates a current. And the current draws more water in through the pores. So they filter about 22, uh, it depends on the size of the sponge. Of course, there's a magnificent array of sizes, but on average, perhaps 22 liters per day of water is filtered. 
using this method. So quite a lot of water. So the first cells to encounter food are the coanocytes. So these are little vacuoles in here with food inside, particles from the water. What would they be? Uh, things like bacteria, um, but also other small um, protists, single cells. Well, some of that food gets digested by this particular cell, but some of the food, interestingly, is passed off to another cell that's part of this multicellular animal called an amoebocyte. An amoebocyte. And amoebocytes are, are quite interesting because they, they travel around the body of the sponge delivering food to other cells that don't have access to it. Yeah, so it, the amoebocyte's a little uh, delivery cell. There's no, there's no circulatory system at all in the sponge. Yeah, so some of the cells are, are epidermal, so there are cells that line the outside of the animal. Uh, the meso, the, the, sorry, porocytes are cells that provide the channel. And mesohyl, that just refers to the substance that's um, filling the spaces, the space filler. Yeah, so food gets trapped in these collar cells. It gets trapped in there. It's like a little net trapping. Um, they just absorb the food by endocytosis. So a very simple mechanism. And they exchange it with the amoeba, the amoeba site via exocytosis. Yeah, so that's, that's a sponge. They have a skeleton of sorts. Uh, their skeleton is, there's actually different kinds of skeleton. Uh, there's, it's built by the amoeba sites. They build the skeleton from either calcium carbonate or silica. Yeah, so the silica, as you can see here, are shaped like spicules. They're called spicules because they're kind of spiky. And this, I just, I just put this in because it's basically spicule art. <laughs> so somebody, somebody collected spicules and made a little art diagram out of them. This is the stomach of a hawksbill turtle. So the turtle eats the sponges, but can't digest the silica. So the silica ends up being in the stomach of the turtle. Um, I don't know. I don't know if it kills them, actually, because it is their food source, so it probably doesn't. Another type of skeleton of the sponge is a protein called spongin, and it's extremely porous. And so that's why uh, sponges are used for, you know, baths. Although really a natural sponge shouldn't really be used for baths or for artwork because they are animalia. Uh, they do come from the ocean and they're an, an integral part of an ocean ecosystem. How do they reproduce? Well, they have both sexual and asexual methods of reproduction. Um, they are largely hermaphroditic. They're hermaphrodites. Um, but they produce eggs and sperm at different times. And that is presumably so that they don't um, self-breed. So instead, they cross-breed with other sponges. That leads to more variety in the DNA of the various populations. So these are gametes broadcasting. And if you ever see this underwater, if you ever have a chance to dive and see it, it looks like smoke is coming out of a smokestack. And this, this is sperm of 
a species of sponge which is directed toward the same species by chemicals exuded by that individual. Yeah, so interestingly, when the sperm arrives at another sponge, the amoebocytes deliver the sperm to where the eggs are in the sponge. So sperm is delivered to eggs by amoebocytes. And the eggs develop into ciliated larvae. They're ciliated to um, be able to move to new sites to colonize, so away from their parents. So that's, this is sexual reproduction. But they also exhibit asexual reproduction. These are gemmules on the surface of a sponge and the gemmules are formed simply by packaging different types of cells, um, all of the different types that the organism will need to grow again into a, a package. So gemmules are packaged cells of each kind. So those are resistant to uh, adverse conditions like cold and uh, lack of food. They're just dormant until conditions get better and then they will just grow into adult sponges. So one of the neatest things about sponges is that, and this is why they sort of are on that cusp between being colonial and multicellular, is that you can put a sponge in a blender, well don't put it in a blender, but if you did put it in a blender, a gentle blender, but separated all the cells, then if you put those cells into a bowl of water, it would reform into an adult sponge. So there really is a fine line between being a colony of cells and being a multicellular animal. So these are some of the largest sponges, uh, the barrel sponge it's called. It's uh, six to eight feet tall. And possibly six to eight feet across as well. They're very, very large. There is even a carnivorous sponge. So this is a sponge here, and I should do this in red. That's the sponge part, and its spicules are external. So when a sea star comes along, it basically gets speared, gets speared onto the spicules of the sponge, can't get away, so it starts to decompose, and the decomposing particles then are sucked into the sponge's body through the pores. Yeah, very unusual mechanism for getting food. This is a, an, this orange part here, that's an encrusting sponge. Encrusting sponge, very, very thin. It, it crusts over substrate. But what's odd is that this Oh, now I need a different color. This is a nudibranch, a sea slug, and it eats the sponge and incorporates the sponge's pigments into its own skin, its own epidermal cells, so that it's camouflaged against the sponge. Not only that, but the nudibranch 
lays eggs, so these are long coils of eggs, with the same coloration. So the eggs are protected from predators by camouflaging with the sponge. Absolutely fantastic. And there are also some symbionts of, of uh, cyanobacteria, blue-green algae, that are symbiont symbionts with sponges. There's another quite large and cresting sponge. Okay, I have a question. So let's see, let, let's go back one. Let's just talk about the sponge for a second. So does the sponge have any symmetry? Or would you say that the sponge was asymmetric? So I'll bring up the chat and you could answer in the chat if you like. Do you think that the sponge, the different sponges that you've seen, do you think that they're asymmetric, that they have radial symmetry or that they have no symmetry? What would you say? Asymmetric, yeah, good. They really don't have a lot of symmetry, no. So there is no, there is no head end per se, there's no tail end, there's no mouth, there's no anus, there's no gastrointestinal cavity, there's no gut. So where are your senses? Where, where are our senses concentrated? The extremities? Yeah, extremities, yes. And in particular, in our head. <laughs> in the head of this uh, dragonfly. That's known as cephalization. So cephalization is the concentration of senses in the head. Yes. And that's because the anterior end of an animal that's moving um, gets contacts its environment first. And as such, that's where the senses are most useful. And that's the, the useful place for the nervous system to start to develop in order that it can interpret the environment and send signals to the rest of the body. So there's two main body plans of the rest of the animals we're going to talk about. One is radial symmetry and the other is bilateral symmetry. Uh, radial symmetry is such that uh, like sea stars, for example, oh no, that's a terrible sea star, hang on. <laughs> that's my sea star. So, the way you can tell something has radial symmetry is if you were to slice it anywhere, both halves would be symmetrical. If you were to slice it here, these two halves would be symmetrical. It doesn't matter where you slice it, uh, the two halves will be symmetrical. Um, one, one side of a ra uh, radially symmetric organism is oral, and the other side is aboral. Bilateral symmetry, in contrast, is such that you can only divide the animal one way in order for the two sides to be symmetric. So you can only bisect it right down the middle from the mouth to the anus. And for a bilateral organism, the top is usually the dorsal side, ventral is below, anterior is the front, posterior is the back. So now we're getting into organisms that have radial symmetry. And those are cnidarians. Cnidarians, the stinging, stinging tentacle uh, invertebrates. There's really two, two radial body plans. Um, they turn out to be identical though. It's just that one is upside down. So for your corals and such and your anemones, uh, you have polyps whereby the tentacles are at the top and they're usually, um, usually but not, not always stuck in a kind of a substrate at the bottom. The other type of body plan, radial body plan, is the Medusa style. So this is 
This one is a polyp, but this one is a medusa. It's like a bell and the tentacles are at the bottom. So those are your jellies. But there's some very interesting parts of this organism. It is starting to develop tissues. The sponge didn't have any tissue, but the nadarians do. They have, for example, epidermal tissue. So these cell uh, tissues are cells that all have the same function. In this case, it's epidermal tissue, so it provides protection and diffusion. Uh, there's also gastrodermal tissue. That's the tissue that does the digesting. It has a gastrovascular cavity. Um, it, it traps things with the tentacles and pulls them into the cavity where they're digested. And it's the same whether it's a polyp or a medusa. It's the same method. So here's an anemone in the polyp style, and here's a jelly in the medusa style. Polyp is sessile. Normally, sessile means it's non-motile, and medusa is mobile. So what's um, interesting and unifies the nadaria are cells with harpoons called nidocytes. Site means cell. Cells with harpoons that catch, capture prey. And they do that because these harpoons contain a neurotoxin that can, um, that can stun prey, and therefore they can pull them in with their tentacles. So this will be one of the nidocytes. And within the nidocyte is an organelle called a nematocyst. And the nematocyst contains a coil that unwinds and stings a prey. So the, the speed at which it releases that little harpoon is just phenomenal. It's something crazy like mm, one, you know, I heard this on a, a show the other day. It was one trillionth of a second. I don't know if that's true. That's anecdotal, but it's very, very, very fast. It's very fast. And the reason it's so fast is that it works by uh, essentially osmosis. So uh, the environment changes and water rushes into the cell, thereby releasing and pushing out the nematocyst. There are some really cool um, symbiotic relationships between some of these nadarians and other animals. This is a, an anemone. And this is Nemo, <laughs> a clownfish. And the clownfish doesn't get affected by the nematocyst. It has some kind of mucus on its body. It's not fully understood, really, how that works. But it keeps away other fishes that feed on the anemone. So other fishes are butterfly fish that feed on the anemone. Uh, but they're scared of the clownfish. Uh-oh. <laughs> You may or may not appreciate this humor. Depends how much you like Nemo, I suppose. <laughs> In this case, he ended up as sushi. <laughs> ah, poor Nemo. Oh, dear. So a reproduction of nadarians can be also asexual or sexual. So both kinds of reproduction. Interestingly, asexual reproduction is... Uh, nope. Budding. So in this case, this is a hydra. You'll be looking at hydra tomorrow. Um, they just bud off a piece of themselves, and that grows into an adult individual. Another method is fission. This is an anemone. And when the anemone gets... Um, large, too large, it will just simply divide itself in half into two new smaller anemones. Yeah, so eventually the animal will get so large that it can't feed its whole body. So it needs to divide into two. A sexual reproduction is, uh, it's not too complicated really. 
the adult buds off, whether it's a, whether it's a Medusa or not, or even if it's a polyp, it buds off a, a Medusa form. And the Medusa has gonads, and the gonads go through meiosis, uh, producing eggs and sperm. They're fertilized externally, forming a zygote, and the zygote grows up to be a larvae, again with cilia, able to move around. Eventually, it will plant itself somewhere and develop into a polyp. There are various classes of nadaria, the anthozoa, those are your corals, your anemones, your sea pens, the cubozoa, like the box jellyfish. And I'll just give you a few examples of each. Uh, the hydrozoa, hydroids, fire cor corals, medusae, and the scyphozoa are your true jellyfish. Here's some examples of brain coral. Brain coral, which is a colony of polyps. Uh, corals are all colonies of polyps. The sea pen, also a colony of polyps. And an anemone, which is a polyp. That's just one polyp, quite a large one. Uh, corals excrete calcium carbonate that they, they live on and the calcium carbonate accumulates and they grow on top of the calcium carbonate that they have secreted. Now what's interesting is that Charles Darwin, early on on his voyage, he noticed something about coral reefs. He noticed that they were a certain distance from the shore, um, but uh, I'm trying to remember how, what his observations were. But he deduced from his observations that that the the ocean crust and the and the continents must be moving in some way because corals have to be near light. So if they're offshore, it's because they've grown on top of the calcium carbonate and they've managed to grow up to the surface, but they don't grow in deep water. So he wondered uh, how it was that they had ever survived before they secreted the calcium carbonate, they would have been too deep. So he sur sur surmised that they must have been in shallower water at some time in the past, therefore the oceanic crust must have been moving. Yeah, very interesting deduction and true as it happens. So the symbionts that live inside corals and anemones are called zooxanthellae. They're symbiotic dinoflagellates. They live in the tissue of certain nadaria. So why are they symbionts? Well, what, what, does the, what does the coral get out of this relationship? That's my question to you. What, what does the coral get out of this symbiotic relationship? How does it benefit, do you think? got these little uh, photosynthesizing zooxanthellae living inside its tissue. So here, and it's providing the nadaria with something. What is the product of photosynthesis that it's providing the nadaria? You can type it in the chat if you want. Sugar. It's sugar. So photosynthesis takes um, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and water and it produces sugar and oxygen. So the zooxanthellae, which used to be extremely common inside corals, although they seem to be exiting, um, they are the photosynthesizers. They provide sugar and what does the coral provide? Access to light. Access to light and protection from predation. So it's a, it's a mutualistic kind of arrangement. Um, unfortunately, 
corals are bleaching or the zooxanthellae are um, abandoning the corals and they they don't survive over the long period without their their symbionts some are extremely poisonous or toxic i should say uh, the cubazoa include box jellyfish so they're one of the most uh, toxic animals there are this is a warning sign and you can hold the box jellyfish by the bell the top that's not where the nematocysts are they're always in the tentacles yes and they're they're uh, very toxic if one gets a uh, sting by a box jellyfish then you need to get uh, medical attention right away um, they have a neurotoxin it's quite powerful but it's also a very large nadarian so i was in australia for a while and it got to be summer there their summer which is excruciatingly hot in some places and then you couldn't go swimming because of the because of the box jellyfish it really wasn't fair yeah you just couldn't go swimming now the hydrozoa are such things as the hydra hydroids the fire coral and the medusae so some of them are sessile polyps some of them are motile and some of them are colonies like the fire coral The freshwater hydrozoans are called hydra, and that's what we'll look at tomorrow. Um, the Portuguese man of war, that's uh, also a jelly, but it's not a single jelly. So what's been discovered about the Portuguese man of war is that it's a colony of different kinds of polyps. So this bell at the top, that, that keeps the, the colonies floating and moving around to search for prey and such. But underneath, these turn out to be different colonies of, of polyps. It's very interesting. So some of them, some of the colonies have the stinging tentacles. So they are uh, predator colonies, I guess. with nematocysts, a, oopsie. some of them are digestive. And the other one is, let's say I wrote it down. Um, where did it go? Oh, reproducing, yeah. So some are polyps that they just simply reproduce. Scyphozoa are the true jellyfish and the largest jellyfish, or jelly, I don't really call them fishes anymore, is uh, this one. This is called Cyania arctica, found in the North Atlantic. The largest specimen has been measured up to seven feet, six inches. No, that's just the bell. That's just the bell here, seven feet. The tentacles are 120 feet. So an extremely large jelly. Okay, I have an odd question for you. Have you ever thought about the location of your internal organs <laughs> and how they're distributed and how it is that they manage to remain in one place? Where is your heart? Do clams have hearts? Yes. Yes, they do. The, the thing about the mollusca is that they, they have tissues, they have cavities, they have all the organ systems, essentially. So uh, the nadaria had radial symmetry and a gastrovascular cavity and some tissue, but no organs. Uh, the organisms with bilateral symmetry, they do. Uh, the platyhelminthes doesn't have a true body cavity, um, or it doesn't have any body cavity, actually. The nematoda have a pseudocelum, but the other organisms that we're going to be looking at, such as the mollusca here, 
it's a protostome, so it does have a coelom from cell masses, a true coelom. So that's a cavity that can hold organs. It can separate the organs from the rest of the animal, and the organs have specific functions. So even though you might not think about, think about that when you're looking at clams or mussels, but they have pretty much all of the organ systems that a human has. And here are some examples. Does anybody recognize them? Do you recognize any, any of these, these animals? There's a cuttlefish at the bottom center. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. This is a cuttlefish down here. Very well-developed nervous system, quite amazing. A large brain, as we saw in the, in the film. Large eyes, amazing eyes that have um, developed at a different evolutionary line than vertebrate eyes, and yet it is a complex lens and cornea eye. What about this one up here? What's that one? Do you recognize that? It's very large, but uh, it's a clam. It's a giant clam. And these are razor mussels. These ones, do you recognize those from the film? Uh, would it be the octopus uh, eggs? Yeah, yeah, the little eggs, yeah, of the octopus. Yes, indeed, this is a snail a land snail, a gastropod, yeah. The octopus is known as a cephalopod, which means head foot. Uh, this here is a nautilus. It's a, a relative, it's also a cephalopod, but it has a pinhole eye, interestingly. It doesn't have a complex lens and cornea eye. This one up here is a chitin, which has eight plates. It's a little bit like an anemone. So where do you find mollusks? <laughs> At the market. Yeah, mollusks are a large food source for many animals, including humans. I don't know if you've ever seen around here the, the crows and the gulls and like we, we get swarms of ducks here from all over the world, essentially, to eat some of our um, invertebrates, mollusks clams, mussels, yeah, delish, oysters. They're complex, they're complex. They have a muscular system, digestive, circulatory, nervous, excretory, respiratory, and reproductive. There's seven classes, the aplacophora, the monoplacophora, the scaphopoda, I'm not talking about any of those. The polyplacophora, the chitons, uh, we'll talk about those a little bit, I think. The gastropods, those are your slugs and snails. The bivalvia, those are your clams and mussels and such. And the cephalopoda, those are your um, octopus, nautilus, squid, and cuttlefish. So the gastropods are such things as conches, abalone, snails, and slugs. There's about 40,000 or so species of the gastropods. This is one of the largest ones. This one is a syrinx arowanus, a trumpet conch. It's 40 pounds, 40 pounds, enormous. The gastropods include the sea slugs, known as nudibranchia. Nudibranchia, which means naked gill, so their gills are exposed. Um, there's two kinds, there's an aeolid and a dorid. Um, they have different, they have gills in, in different places, so these are the gills of the dorids and the aeolids, they just have these extensions of their epidermis called serrata 
and that's where they exchange gases. So gills are a structure with which organisms exchange gases with the environment. And nudibranchs are so amazing that I've put an entire, an entire um, slideshow of them because they are amazing in color and in, in style. It's, they have uh, rhinopores. Those sense the environment. They have a mantle, as all mollusks do, but they're soft-bodied. They have gills, they have a tail, and a foot, as all mollusks do. They move around with the foot. And they're amazing in how they, they blend in with the environment. Uh, these pictures that I'm going to show you now were taken in the poor nights in Australia. I'm sorry, in, uh, in New Zealand, in New Zealand. An aeolid nudibranch, oh, sorry, also has rhinopores, and the serrata that exchange gases, um, tentacles that, that sense the surrounding, a foot, and oral tentacles as well. So they have a number of sensory organs, and they're also quite beautiful. These are all, um, this is all underwater photography that has been taken with equipment to show the colors because they can be quite deep. If you, if you go into the ocean and you try to see things uh, low, like where, there, where the sun doesn't penetrate, uh, well, you won't be able to see it because it's black. So, so they use uh, special kinds of lights to get all the colors. An aeolid. Adore it. They're just fantastic. Um, they can store the nomadocysts of the hydra if they get, get to eat a hydra or an anemone. So they can store nomadocysts and also pigments into their epidermis, which is quite remarkable. So there's lots to be learned from and about these various sea slugs. And these are the islands. the North Island of New Zealand. And I don't know if I have, I, I don't have the, um, the citation. Sorry about that. I will include it. I will include it though in the lecture. It's a fantastic photographer that took all those pictures. One last one, okay, I couldn't resist. <laughs> So that, those are in the gastropoda, the sea slugs. Um, a class, another class is known as the bivalvia. Valve stands for shell. So bivalve means two-shelled. These are two-shelled organisms. They include your clams, oysters, mussels, and scallops. So also mollusca. The giant clam, one of the largest clams. And what's interesting about the clams is that they also have eye spots that can detect the surrounding. They're very large, and some people think that you can get caught in the shell. If you accidentally, if you're a diver and you accidentally put your leg inside the clam, that can snap closed, but they don't, at that size, they don't snap closed, yeah.
It also includes um, muscles. Sorry. Muscles. So uh, on our coast, you find an, an abundance of muscles, particularly the blue muscle. And interestingly, the scallops in particular have eyes. I'll show them to you in another slide in a second. The muscles have threads, they're sessile, so they don't move around. They stay in one place and they siphon uh, food out of the environment, out of the water. This is one of a larger one known as a gooey duck. This is the siphon of the gooey duck, which is edible. It's actually quite good. So the siphons role is to bring water into the animal so that it can filter it with its gills. And the gills are on the inside. These are the eyes I was talking about. This is a scallop. The scallop has 60 eyes. 60 eyes that hang down from its shell uh, where it opens. And it's, they're these amazing, tiny, little lens and cornea eyes. And the light goes in, it reflects off the back. They have receptors in there that can detect uh, light, direction of prey, and shapes. Another class of the mollusca is called cephalopoda, which means a hand foot, or sorry, head foot, head foot. That includes squid, octopus, the cuttlefish, and the nautilus. And the nautilus is interesting because if you look back to the first kinds of animals that looked like nautilus, you would find the trilobites. And the trilobites, or not trilobites, sorry, am ammonites, ammonites. And the ammonites were extremely abundant a very long time ago, but they don't exist at all now. So it's, it seems clear that the nautilus is probably a descendant of the ammonites. There's some very interesting species. Uh, the red octopus, the octopus rubescens, extremely good at blending into the environment. Some are very, very small. This one is called I forget, but it is the size of a golf ball. It's an octopus and it's extremely poisonous, interestingly. Blue ringed octopus. Yeah, quite poisonous. So what I'd like to do is stop there for now. Thank you.